Yeah, I did uh, yesterday. Oh, sorry. Uh, I, I went along. Um, Okay, let's begin. BSM number three, the strong CV problem. Okay, doke. So I guess uh, everyone's getting a bit tired. Six hours, is, six hours of lectures is one, in one day is quite a lot. Um, but I hope, uh, I hope I can keep you all awake for the next hour and a half. So we're going to change, uh, change direction quite dramatically now. Um, in my first lecture on Monday, I pointed out that the two things I really wanted to, to talk about were the hierarchy problem and the weak scale and the strong CP problem. Um, so we're going to delve into the strong CP problem today. The reason uh, for having this lecture today is that also, you know, Tracy and Robert both uh, discussed the axion today, so we're going to come to the axion, but from a more uh, theoretical angle and a less phenomenological angle, maybe I might mention a, a very, very briefly some phenomenology. And then, if we get time at the end, we might be able to swing back towards the electroweak hierarchy problem to, to discuss some speculative ideas that sort of link the physics of the axion with the electroweak hierarchy problem at the end. These are by no means broadly accepted approaches to the hierarchy problem, but uh, an interesting set of ideas that's very sort of modern and, and relevant at the moment that people have been studying. So hopefully we can swing back towards the hierarchy problem if we get time. So the strong CP problem, I, I hope many of you have heard of it. And it's all concerned with a particular uh, uh, interaction in the standard model, which you can write in various forms. I'm going to write it this way. So G is the, the QCD gauge coupling. Uh, theta is some constant term that um, we will discuss at length. So it's just some constant number. Um, and it, as you'll see, it takes angular uh, values. And then we have the, the, the fully anti-symmetric tensor. Um, and these are just the, the field strengths for um, QCD, for the gluons. So this term is really one of the most remarkable and special terms that you can write down in the, in the, the standard model. It's, uh, I find it absolutely fascinating. And it teaches us uh, two very interesting lessons um, about um, quantum field theory. So, of course, this has been studied at great length for many decades. But um, similar terms, they're known as topological terms, um, have, ha, are, are very interesting and relevant in, in wide, area, wide ranges of, of quantum field theories, from condensed matter physics to string theory uh, and all sorts of, of applications. So what we learn by studying the strong CP uh, term is, uh, is um, uh, broadly applicable. It's called strong CP because this term here, you can see it violates CP. This, is a, this combination here is CP odd, so if you have a, a non-zero value for this guy, um, the, the, uh, you have CP violation in the strong sector. And it teaches us two, two important things. Um, the first is that sometimes a classical symmetry is not a quantum symmetry. Um, and this is really blew my mind when I, when I first learned it, so we will come to that first. And uh, the second thing that you learn about this term is that total derivatives 
matter. Um, and what I mean by this is normally, um, as I'm sure uh, you're familiar with, when we look, when we calculate in some quantum field theory some scattering amplitudes, some perturbative scattering amplitudes, some process for the LHC or, or, or some other high energy process, there are many terms we could have in the action which are actually total derivatives. And what we tend to do is we just throw them away. Because we know when we evaluate the integral over a total derivative, what we do is just evaluate the, that term that's been differentiated on the boundaries of the surface. And you know, by, by design, when we set up a scattering process, we're assuming that the fields vanish at infinity, the values of the field, fields vanish at infinity. So when you have total derivatives in the action, they don't contribute in any way to perturbative scattering amplitudes. So normally we chuck them away, forget about them, who cares? And this term here, it turns out we will see it's actually a total derivative. So you might think, who cares? And indeed, in, in any perturbative process that you might uh, consider, scattering process involving gluons or anything like that, um, that could, could potentially involve this guy, you, will see, you would find, if you sc calculated the scattering amplitudes, that there'd be no dependence on it. But what's really, really interesting is that actually the physics um, does depend on this, and the hadronic physics that we will come to does depend on this, which tells, tells you that sometimes, if you have non-trivial uh, uh, field configurations, the uh, total derivatives can matter. Okay, so the first bit, quantum symmetries. versus classical. Um, so consider, uh, uh, for, this, for this application, consider an SU3 gauge theory with some fermions in the fundamental. So the, the kinetic terms will look something like this. I'll work with Dirac spinners. I prefer vial spinners, but I understand most uh, textbooks work in terms of Dirac spinners, so we will do that. And we have the kinetic terms, which look like this, where this is the gauge covariant derivative, involving the, the, the QCD gauge fields that live in here, the, the gluons. Um, so we, if we start this action, we see that we can perform a rotation on um, this Dirac spinner, which goes like e to the i, I will call it alpha. Alpha is just a constant number. Uh, gamma five psi, so psi goes to e, e to the i alpha gamma five psi. Um, in terms of vial spinners, this is like rotating the left and right-handed guys by separate phases that are equal and opposite. And if you perform this rotation, this is a constant, so the derivative doesn't care about it. You can see, calculate, it's a, a good exercise to do it. I think it's even in the exercises for, for tomorrow. Um, you do this Carroll rotation, and you will find that this term is, is unchanged. So what we say is that this, that this is uh, uh, an axial symmetry. You could also do just with the identity matrix in here, and you would call that the vector uh, symmetry, but this is the axial symmetry. So this is a classical symmetry. Um, however, in a, in a QFT, it is not sufficient to have a symmetry. It's not sufficient that the Lagrangian uh, is unchanged or is just changed up to total derivatives. Uh, QFT is more than the Lagrangian. It's the full, uh, the full path integral. So if we study the path integral, it looks like this, where we, we actually um, do the path integral over the, the various uh, configurations of um, the fermions. And then we have the normal action. I'm setting h bar to, to 1. So we see that when we, when we do uh, this transformation, this term is unchanged. So normally, classically, we would say that this is a symmetry of the, the theory. But that's not sufficient. Indeed, you have to convince yourself to really know that the theory, the full quantum theory, the path integral is invariant under this transformation. Then. Um, this term also has to be invariant. Normally, normally, we don't worry about this so much. We just work with our classical action and forget about this term. But um, in practice, you can't always do that. And so, so how can you calculate, determine whether or not this is invariant? I'm not going to go through all of the details because it's quite uh, long but uh, very um, enlightening calculation to do it. But you will just remember, if you, if you were to discretize, you can break this up into fields at different points, and it looks like a very large multiple integral. And we know how to deal with uh, the change of the measure when we have a multiple 
multiple integral, we just calculate the Jacobian. In this case, it's a very large Jacobian. But when we do multiple integrations, say an integral, integral over an area, and we change, change our coordinate definitions, we always have to take into account the Jacobian. And you can do that here. And when you do that, you see that the, the um, pathing and integral measure changes by an amount, uh, we call it the Jacobian to the minus 2, um, under this change of variables, which corresponds to the, the, um, uh, the rotation of these fermions. And it turns out you can show the best, well, the, this was, has been shown in a number of different ways, but the, the, the most, I think, uh, easily accessible method is, is, uh, was really developed by Fujikawa. Um, by studying the change of the, the, the path integral measure. And Fujikawa showed that actually the value of this Jacobian, or Jacobian to the minus two, I guess. Sorry, I'll just write it on this side, I'm not good at it. The value of this Jacobian term in the, in the path integral measure is actually non-zero. And it looks like the path integral over the fermions again So how does this come about? Um, where on earth did the, did the uh, uh, gauge fields come from? So you will remember that in here, there's, there's gauge fields living in the, the, the covariant derivative. So they look like, as you'll remember from electromagnetism, the gauge fields look sort of like a, a shift in the momentum of the fermion when the derivative, they, they enter in the same way that the, the derivatives enter. And when you integrate, over all of the, the field configurations, you, you just do a quadratic integral over the field configurations. That shift in the momentum actually gets dragged along as you're integrating over all of the momenta of the, the fermions and the path integral. Um, and when you cons consistently include it the whole time, um, you find that you get terms that look like the, the derivatives of the gauge fields when it's getting pulled along. And you can rearrange them, and you see that it takes this form here. So what you see is that the 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 modified path integral, so the path integral after I've done this, this, field, this uh, uh, Carroll rotation, looks like the, the in initial path integral. Sorry about my, my, my curly Ds are terrible. Um, it looks like the initial path integral with an additional factor. which is not equivalent to the original path integral that you started with, this guy here. So this is really remarkable. I think if you're not impressed or excited by this, you can't be human, because it's really, uh, it's really an incredible thing. Yep. Uh, uh, oh, sorry, yes, there shouldn't have been L. Sorry, thank you. Thank you. Um, Pardon? In the, uh... ah, no, sorry, you're right, sorry. I'm, I must have, um... no, you're absolutely right. I, uh, thank you very much. Absolutely, it's just that. Let me move it across. Thank you very much. Um, OK. So this is really remarkable. You start with a, a theory that has a classical symmetry. And you could do all the classical physics you ever want to do with it. And there will always be a conserved current. and. Uh, uh, um, and um, you can calculate it, and know their currents and things like this. You can do all of the classical physics that you know and love. But sheerly by introducing quantum mechanics, the quantum mechanics itself breaks the symmetry. The fact that h-bar isn't zero breaks the symmetry. 
um, which is really uh, uh, totally amazing. It's saying that this U1, this, this rotation, which you could call a U1 axial symmetry, um, is not actually a symmetry of the path integral, um, but you can only see it uh, through quantum mechanical effects. And it's physical. It has, it has real uh, uh, consequences, serious consequences. Because one thing, I'm going to go back to pions again, I'm afraid. I always go back to pions. But um, when we started with the global symmetries that were spontaneously broken by the quark condensate in the first lecture, I said that there was an SU2 left cross an SU2 right uh, uh, global symmetry, which is spontaneously broken, or it's an approximate symmetry, spontaneously broken to the, the, uh, a diagonal SU2. So because the, the dimension of SU2 cross SU2 is six and the dimension of SU2 is three, we should have three Goldstone bosons, which are the pions. But I, I was being slightly dishonest at that point because actually the, the action has an SU2 left cross SU2 right cross U1 axial symmetry, in, uh, classical symmetry. So you should actually expect four Goldst pseudo Goldstone bosons, the three pions plus an extra guy. Yep. Okay. Um, so you would expect to have four Goldstone bosons. And the fourth would, have, would be called the eta prime, or it's called the eta prime. But in fact, it's not light precisely because of this reason, because U1 axial symmetry is not actually a symmetry of the, the quantum theory. Yep. Uh, good question. Uh, so the question was, if anyone didn't hear it, could you have a symmetry that's a symmetry that's not a symmetry of the classical theory, but is a symmetry of the quantum theory? So you have some quant compensating change in the path integral measure that, that cancels it. I don't know of any good examples. My suspicion would probably be that maybe not, because you would have to do something. Um, there's really... Uh, there's really an H bar flying around in here. I've set it to one. So you'd have to do something, I think, in the classical action that would involve H bar, but I don't know. It's a super question. Yep. Uh, sure. 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 Yep. Yeah, you could add in effect, terms in the effective theory that. Uh, that would transform, you could do something like that. And um, we'll sort of, yeah, absolutely. Okay, so this so far was just for massless fermions, so now let's go to, to massive fermions. So when we add masses, now our action is slightly changed. We have the kinetic terms from before. And I'm going to put a, a potential phase, so I'm going to write it, I'm going to sandwich it between the two Dirac spinners. As I said, if you work with vial spinners, you could just see this as a relative phase between the left and right-handed guys. Um, so it doesn't have to be sandwiched between spinners, but the way I will write it, um, it will be. Or we have E to the minus 2i, I'm going to call it theta q, gamma 5, phi, uh, plus the gauge pieces. Um, so this is just a generic phase that this uh, uh, mass term could have. So essentially, if I wrote this as a mass for the a different mass for the left and right chiral spinners, um, you could have uh, uh, equal and opposite phases in the mass terms for those guys. Now, um, so this is just a phase that could be there. And in fact, you know, in flavor physics, we already know that. We, we've seen an off-diagonal relative phase. It's not, not um, an axial one like this. We've seen an off-diagonal rel relative phase, which is um, the, the, strong CP ang uh, the strong CP phase. Sorry, not the strong CP phase, the, the CKM phase. And um, so generically, we expect there to be phases in, in the mass matrix. There's no reason that a fermion mass matrix initially should be, should be a real quantity. But typically, what we do is we just rotate them away. If they're unphysical, we can, can rotate them away and forget about them uh, thereafter. So we do a rotation to try and rotate this away and get rid of it. 
So we do the rotation that phi, psi, sorry, goes to e to the i, c to q, gamma phi, psi. And that removes the phase from the, from the fermion mass entirely. So the fermion mass now just becomes totally real. But now we get a new, because we've got this quantum anomaly, this is yeah, known as an anomaly whenever the classical symmetry is not a symmetry of the path integral, we get a new term which um, involves that phase. We get a new term because that was not actually a symmetry. We, couldn't, we know we can't actually get rid of it. We get rid of it in the mass term, and it pops up over here as the strong CP angle. Um, similarly, we could have started um, right from the get-go. There's no reason that, that this term should initially have been zero in the first place, so I'll just, I would still call this theta. Um, and in which case, that if this term was already there, some term like that was already there, we've got theta g squared over 32 pi squared g g joule. And now in here, we have a real mass term, but now we've got theta q plus theta g squared over 32 pi squared gg joule. And, um, and uh, so, so we've shifted what we originally defined as theta now includes uh, the phase that was in the mass matrix. Um, but we can't get rid of this combination. I could similarly do a chiral rotation on these guys of minus i theta q plus theta and completely kill it from, from this term but it will show up again in the mass matrix. You can never get rid of it. Yep. Using what, sorry? Yeah, yeah, so one way to see it, you'll, the, the famous uh, triangle diagrams. So you see it as, an, as, a, as, a, as a, you can calculate exactly the same physics using, a, using the tri triangle diagrams. Um, and you'll get exactly the same result. Why I like the path integral one is that um, it, it's absolutely equivalent, so, so, so it's really fine to do it, but I like the path integral one for two reasons. One is it's very, uh, very physical in the sense that you have your action, and you're seeing that a symmetry is spoiled, but you're seeing really where it's coming from, that this is sort of the classical bit of the, of the theory, and this is the quantum bit of the theory, and you see that with Fujikawa's method, you see that that's where it's coming up from. And the next thing is that actually this is exact at one loop. You see this is essentially a loop factor in here. And the result is exact is to all orders. So it's exact at one loop. And that's another, you can see this more directly from the path integral method than by drawing the, drawing the triangle diagrams. If you drew higher order diagrams, you would see that nothing shows up. So I, I prefer the Fujikawa way, but actually, yes, there are two or three different ways of approaching this. Um, okay, so yeah, so I could do a chiral rotation on the fermion fields and eliminate this part entirely, but I won't have eliminated the combination because it will show up again in the mass matrix. Now this would be theta q plus theta. So we can't get rid of it. No matter how, it's like a whack-a-mole. You, you, you hit it in one place and it'll pop up in another place and you keep doing this, you'll never get rid of it. Um, if you convince yourself that you have gotten rid of it, then, uh, then you've made a mistake. Um, but why care? The reason I, I say why care is that if we study, stare at this term, we can see that it is actually a uh, total derivative. And you can see that in a, in a number of ways. I'm going to write down the explicit form of the total derivative. So say we've got g squared over, g squared theta over 32 pi squared g g joule. I can equivalently write this as uh, g squared theta over 32 pi squared d mu of j mu. This j mu is a, yep.
Ah. Right. Right. So you're saying, what if this is really QCD and these are the light quarks? And I can never measure a pole mass for a quark when the bare mass term is 4 MeV. Um, yes, indeed. A better way to see it is, that, is to avoid ever having to talk about a mass. Uh, and you can frame it more simply, which is that uh, what has actually happened, we'll come to this, but what is actually happening is when you set this mass term to zero is that you're covering what's known as a Petchy Quinn symmetry, a PQ symmetry. And because you have that PQ symmetry, I can, you can perform a single PQ uh, redefinition without changing any of the physics, which does eliminate this guy. So a, a cleaner statement isn't to talk about massless or massive or poles or anything like that. It's to talk about PQ symmetry. And uh, if you have a PQ symmetry, then you can eliminate in this case, for ma you have it if it's massless, so you can do a rotation on the quarks to eliminate this guy. Um, uh, um, that's one way of seeing it. Uh, uh, but in, for practical purposes, especially in, the, in QCD, we'll really talk about the light quarks and their masses. Uh, does that answer your question? Um, so what's the question? So that, I agree with that statement. Uh, um, okay, so you're really, I mean, again, I would go back, I would say that what you're really saying is that there's a PQ symmetry um, in the, the standard model itself. So when we add the axion, we, are promoted, we have a PQ symmetry, which is spontaneously broken. But in the standard model itself, you don't have, if you write down all of the Korkukawas, you don't have a PQ symmetry in the standard model. So that's why it doesn't work. If you set one of those quarks to, to be massless, you, you essentially uh, regain a PQ symmetry. Um, so it's not that it's a mass term. It's really, that it, it's really the quantum numbers it carries under the U1 axial uh, uh, rotation. OK. Um, okay, so, so why, why should I not care about this term at all? It's because it's a total derivative, so we can write it as the total derivative of a current. And this current is, is known, typically there are many names for it, as the Chern-Simons current, just so that you actually believe me. I'm going to write it down. It's not pretty, but... So there it is. So up to total derivatives, if I, if I, um, if I uh, act on this guy with, with d mu, I recover the gg joule term. And as I said, we don't, normally don't care about total derivatives because when we do some sort of perturbative scattering process, um, they give no contributions to uh, the perturbative uh, uh, matrix elements, essentially because the fields are vanishing at infinity. Um, so that's why you shouldn't care about this term. But then why you should care about it is that there are caveats to this logic, which is that um, you can have field configurations which do vanish at infinity, but still um, have non-physical implications uh, when you integrate over the boundary. So a well-known example of this would be um, if you took, take a magnetic field 
and you shield that magnetic field, but you still will have some electromagnetic uh, vector potential um, living outside it. Then if you take uh, an electron and move it around that region that has a, a, a non-trivial magnetic field, even though it doesn't feel the magnetic field itself, um, you can get a non-trivial a non phase shift in the electron, and you will know and, and love this as the Aharonov bomb effect. Is that how you spell it? Aha, Ranov. Uh, so this is something we 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 uh, have known for quite a while, and it turns out that it's it's not completely analogous. But there's a similar there are similar field configurations in QCD, um, which even though they vanish on the boundary, they can have non-trivial implications for the physics when you integrate over all of the boundary, and these are known as instantons. There are various dis different types of these, but I'm going to talk about uh, QCD instantons. And essentially what they are, if you now think of, of all of space as being like a sphere, and you can have these objects living out on, uh, on the, the, the three sphere, and we're living in here. Um, these are field configurations that when you go out to um, infinity, the gauge fields actually do vanish. But nonetheless, the integral in the, back, the instanton background um, over these gauge fields will give a non-vanishing uh, non number um, when there's a non-vanishing uh, 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 theta angle. One way, you can, one way to think about this is that if, uh, this is integrating over this term here, is that these, the, the gauge fields, even though they're vanishing at infinity, they can essentially wind around the sphere in non-trivial ways. So if you were to think about, just as, as a simple example, um, if you were to live in 2D, and um, just something analogous to, to the electron, you could have a, a U1 symmetry, and you could have field configurations that, that do vanish at infinity, so the, the radial component, say you have some scalar field, this is just a, a, a very sloppy analogy, so um, to try and uh, give you an idea of what the instantons look like. But if you had a U1 symmetry with a real scalar field, you could have a field configuration where the scalar field, let's, let's call it the, the radial mode and the phase, they're both fields. So this is, a, sorry, a complex scalar field. You can have field configurations where even though rho is going to zero out, in, out at infinity, the theta is non-trivial. So theta, as you go around, could change by uh, 2 pi. So it has to come back to 2 pi times where it started because it's uh, an angular variable. But you could have a field configuration of phi where you go around, you go around the circle, and when you come back to where you are, um, the, the phase of the field has actually changed by, by 2 pi, or n some integer times 2 pi, even though the actual uh, magnitude of the field has gone to zero out, infi out of infinity. Instantons are sort of like that, except they're much more, uh, much more complicated in, uh, if you were to, you know, if you write down the actual form of the instanton action and things like this. Okay, so you can have instanton field configurations which are, are non-trivial, um, but they are essentially winding around the sphere at infinity. And just like the Har Aharonov bohm effect, this can lead to uh, physical effects in your theory. Um, but they're typically, uh, these effects are non-perturbative. You can see that they're non-perturbative because just by the fact that this is a total derivative, it's not going to give any perturbative contributions uh, uh, to your observable physics. But the non-perturbative effects, when you actually calculate these, uh, the, the action for these instantons, tend to scale um, in this following way. They tend to be proportional to uh, factors like, they always come out looking like this, e to the 8 pi squared over alpha evaluated at some, some RG scale. So this is the, the, the fine structure constant of the, the, the gauge coupling squared divided by 4 pi. So this tells you that whenever your theory is perturbative, if alpha is a small number, then this exponent is, a lar is minus a large number, so these effects will typically be very, very small. So that's why we never talk about them for uh, the electroweak interactions. You could have something like this for the electroweak in interactions, but because they're broken at the electroweak scale, the, relative, the relevant scale in here is, the, is around the weak scale. This is a small number, so e to the minus uh, a very large number is totally irrelevant. 
But they're important for QCD because as we get down to the QCD scale, um, this can start to become an order one number, which means that these instanton effects will typically um, uh, be non-negligible. Um, non and indeed, they lead to a, a physical, we'll see actually in a second where this um, comes from, but they lead to a, a physical implication. For example, you could, as I said before, there are non-perturbative effects that give mass to the eta prime. Similarly, if you have this uh, non-vanishing term for a non-vanishing value for theta, um, this leads to a, a neutron electric dipole moment. And this must have, must have been mentioned earlier. But you can see it in practice. How do you see it in practice? You can do, uh, and you can even you can calculate it, you can do a, a, an axial transformation to move this guy back into the quark masses, and you hold on to him. We're, we're going to do this a little bit later. You hold on to it, and then you just do the normal chiral, uh, uh, chiral Lagrangian. You calculate the um, pion interactions and the pion masses and so on. And you see that you get um, a phase that shows up in the, in the neutron, in neutron scattering. Um, and it shows up essentially in diagrams that involve pions. So you can have something like uh, a neutron, a proton, and a neutron. And you can have charged pions. interacting with uh, the photon. And there's a, uh, a, a, a non-vanishing phase shows up in here. Um, and, and so there are diagrams like this. You can go and look up the old papers from the 70s that do this. And what it uh, leads to is a, an electric dipole moment for the neutron, which uh, scales like the, the, the strong CP angle. So in fact, in, in, in uh, uh, qu quantitatively, what it looks like is that it's proportional to minus uh, theta plus theta q in our old notation, multiplied by the up mass. This is in, in just a, a, a simple calculation. So, and I've left out some, uh, some sort of QCD scale factors out the front, mu plus md, 2ms minus mu uh, minus md. There are more refined uh, formulae for this. So this, this uh, gives you a, a neutron electric dipole moment, which you can, can search for. You know, you can put a neutron in a background electric field and see if the energy levels split uh, proportional to the spin of the neutron. And people have done this and um, determined that this term here, this prefactor, theta plus theta q, or you could call this just theta bar, has to be less than or equal to something like 10 to the minus 10 or 10 to the minus 11. Which is telling us that this overall phase that could have been living in, in, in so there's one linear combination which is physical, living in the quark masses and the, the, the topological term, um, has to be extraordinarily small. I think it's actually more like 10 to the minus 11 in these units. Has to be extraordinarily small. So this is known as the, the, the strong CP problem. Are there any questions at this stage? Of course, I, I went very quickly through the instanton stuff, but uh, um, if there are any questions. Yep. Can you just clarify the denominator? Ah, oh, sorry, yes. Well, it's in the, the lecture notes online as well, so don't worry too much about taking detailed notes. But m, m up plus m down, um, and this is 2m strange minus m up minus m down. Okay, so this is, uh, this is an enormous puzzle. Now, it's not like the, the hierarchy problem where we are wondering about some, some UV completion, um, which we may be quad quadratically sensitive to, something like that. This is sort of different because this, if you were to somehow set this to zero in the first place, set theta plus uh, theta Q, this linear combination to zero in the first place, it would stay pretty small. And in fact, the neutron EDM, yep, Um, uh, this result is gauge independent. Um, so if you set it small from the outset, then, then, um, then it would stay small. Uh, there are other contributions to the, to the, to the neutron EDM, from, for example, from the CKM matrix and, and things like this, but they're all sm much smaller than this, so we don't worry about them so much. But the real puzzle is what boundary condition would set that somehow this term um, knows so this term knows about this term. We already know that there are phases in the quark mass matrix because we've measured it. 
Um, so why would the phases in the quark mass matrix know about the f some phase in here such that they cancel their two values or just, just so that they cancel down to some remarkable uh, uh, degree of uh, precision? You could say, well, there could be some theory at the UV which, which sets it so that way, and to which my answer would be, show me, um, because we don't really have a, a, a convincing uh, story for that. So how can we understand, how could we solve this problem? Is, could we find some dynamical or, or some symmetry-based um, uh, solution to, this, to the strong CP problem? And there are a number of approaches. One um, has already been mentioned, which is the mass to subquark uh, solution. So I won't, um, I won't go into much detail, but you can see that if I um, had zero mass here, so this term doesn't exist, then I can do one uh, rotation on one of the quarks of a value of theta q is equal to minus theta and exactly cancel this guy without changing the rest of the action. Uh, an even more dumb way to see that the mass, massless up quark solution works, or massless quark solution works, is that if I set mu to zero here, this vanishes, reflecting the same physics. Um, there's another one known as spontaneous CP violation. And the notion here is that um, if you were to start with, imagine at high energies, so we're sort of, it's like a boundary, a boundary value problem. Imagine at very high energies, um, CP is a full symmetry of nature. Because if CP were a full symmetry of nature, it would forbid the existence of these CP violating terms. They would not be, they would not be allowed. So that would go towards solving the strong CP problem. And had we not measured CP violation, in, uh, in uh, uh, the flavor sector through the, 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 the CKM phase, that would be a very believable solution because if, if nature were CP invariant, um, then uh, it would be plausible that the, that the UV physics is CP invariant and these guys vanish. But the problem is that we have measured CP violation in nature. Nature isn't CP invariant. So what you do, so the, 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 this is known as, as uh, the Nelson Barr mechanism. Um, I'll put it. You can look it up. Uh, the basic idea is that you have a CP symmetric theory at high energies. And then to explain the, the CP violation that we see at low energies, at some point along the way, you spontaneously break CP as a symmetry. So it's a CP invariant in the UV, and it's spontaneously broken at some scale, and then it becomes a CP violating theory in the IR. But you have to find a way to do that in su uh, such a particular way that um, when you break this CP uh, symmetry spontaneously, it doesn't show up in here. But you do get a, a CP phase for the, for the, CKM, uh, the CKM matrix. So it's, it's hard, and none of the models are particularly aesthetically appealing. Um, sometimes you need to, to set some parameters to zero um, without having a, a symmetry for them or, or, or add field a lot of field content, um, but it is a possibility. I think it's one that people are starting to explore a little bit more these days than it was sort of put to bed for a while. Um, uh, but it is interesting but difficult. And then the, the last solution, which is by far the most popular, is the axion solution to the strong CP problem. Okay, so uh, how does the axion work? So I'm gonna sketch this again, not in a huge amount of detail. You can find more detail in the notes. But the idea is to uh, start with a PQ symmetry. So this is one that lets us um, rotate uh, uh, these quarks. You have to have it somewhere in nature. As I said, the standard model itself does not have a PQ symmetry. So to, have a, to uh, uh, realize a PQ symmetry, you have to add some extra particles. They might be heavy quarks, so they might be an extra Higgs doublet and so on, such that you can do a, a PQ transformation on, on some uh, colored uh, fermion somewhere in the theory. So you have to add matter content. When you do that, you can have a PQ symmetry, and then um, it, you spontaneously break it.
Uh, no, sorry, Peche Quinn. So it was, uh, it was uh, Peche and Quinn that wrote this down. And there's no, the, the, the definition of a PQ symmetry, because you can have, there are very different, there are many different models, and it can involve the standard model quarks or some heavy fields or whatever. The definition of, of PQ symmetry is really one in which you can do a rotation that would have gotten rid of this term. That's the way, the way I would define it. So you spontaneously break this PQ symmetry at high energies, and we already worked with this, uh, this um, the non-linearly realized symmetries this morning. So when we have the spontaneously broken symmetry, we will have some nonlinear realization. So we'll have some complex scalar field, I'm going to call it phi, that gets a vacuum expectation value. So this, this could be a composite. It doesn't have, it's, you don't, needn't think of this as some truly fundamental field. Um, but for, for our purposes, let's, let's think of it as just a simple scalar field. Um, it gets a vacuum expectation value we'll call uh, uh, F. There's some radial mode rho, which is like the Higgs but that can be heavy, so we can forget about them. And we just do the, the essentially the CCWZ thing we discussed this morning, um, but even more simply, because it's just for a U1 symmetry, and then we have the exponentiation, and we have the axion living in here, which is the Goldstone boson of the spontaneously broken uh, PQ symmetry. And it turns out, uh, we'll go through the, the details a little bit, it turns out that, um, of course, if this were PQ were an exact symmetry, which it is at the classical level, this um, Goldstone boson would be exactly massless if there's no breaking. But it turns out that it gets a mass um, and it gets a, a scalar potential, which is just right, just so that it will, um, uh, when it settles to the bottom of its scalar potential, it will exactly cancel the, the strong CP angle. Okay, so how does that work? So I'm, I'm gonna, just gonna show a toy model it's a model that works, but uh, there are many other models on the market. This is just a very simple one. So imagine we start with an action where we have some higher dimension, um, we have some PQ symmetry, such that the, we have uh, uh, a complex scalar phi, which has charge one under the PQ symmetry. We're allowed a, some higher dimension operator like this, and then we have the normal terms where we have the Higgs and, um, and a pair of standard model quarks. We can see that if we didn't have this guy, we couldn't um, perform the axial rotation on the quarks and leave this unchanged, but now we can. Um, essentially because when, when you pick up the Hermitian conjugate, the phase in here uh, 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 will mix with the phase in there. But now we imagine at some scale this is, this is spontaneously broken, so this will pick up the, the VEV out the front, so we end up with just the standard uh, quark mass terms for, for the, um, uh, uh, the, the standard quark Yukawas, which scale like F over big lambda. So I'll just call that the Yukawa coupling, little lambda. And here you have E to the IA over F. And um, when you take the Hermitian conjugate, what this, what this means, and also when the Higgs gets a VEV, so, we'll set, so we could say, yeah, let's do this. We'll keep the Higgs in for one line. And then we have, um, in front of here, I could put in the, sorry, the, the, the phase um, the, in the mass matrix as well. But for now, let's imagine I've done a Carroll rotation just to push that all into here. So we've got theta Q plus theta. So then we've just got E to the I gamma five A over F psi. And then after electric symmetry breaking, this just becomes the quark mass. Something like that. Um, and if we wanted, we could do a further uh, 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 U1 rotation to pull theta Q plus theta that was living out here um, back into the quark mass matrix. So then this becomes, after that transformation, becomes MQ psi bar e to the i gamma five, and then we've got a over f plus theta plus theta q psi. Okay, um, so this is now the, the way the, the axion happens to be coupled to whatever quark it was that we chose. 
Um, it could be any of the quarks you like. Um, this is just sort of a toy model. Um, but below, the, so let's, let's pick, for example, the, the, the up and down quarks. Below the QCD scale, um, if these quarks are light, they will condense. We go back to pions again. Below the QCD scale, the quarks will condense, so we get a non-zero uh, vacuum expectation value for this guy here, uh, which we can just call uh, F pi squared, M pi squared. And this is how you get, you do this to get to, to study pion physics, you do the CCWZ uh, prescription in here, so we have the goldstones of the quark condensate, which are just the, the actual pions. You do exactly the same procedure that we did this morning. I'm gonna skip it. You should really include the pions in, in the quark condensate to do the full um, axion mass calculation, but if you're interested in that, you can read uh, a very nice paper by Giovanni from a few years ago that does it in, uh, in a lot of detail. But the long story short is that when we put this in and we take the Hermitian conjugate, we get a term, the Hermitian conjugate of, of you know, e to the i theta plus e to the minus i theta is just a cosine, so what we actually get is a term that goes like f pi squared m pi squared a over f plus theta plus theta q. Sorry, cosine. So we see when we minimize this potential as a function of the axion background field, um, we want the, uh, so this is, this is the Lagrangian, so the, the, the scalar potential is minus that. So when we, minus this, min, when we minimize the scalar potential, the axion field will want to take on a vacuum expectation value which exactly cancels the, the uh, strong CP angle. And I've kept both of these terms together rather than calling it theta bar or something just to show you that it cancels the, the independent terms that could have arisen in the, in the first place. And because this has exactly canceled this, it's taken a value such that the, the, the overall argument in here is zero. You see that the effective theta term has, has vanished, so you get no contribution to the, the uh, neutron EDM from this, from this guy. Um, so I've gone through it quite quickly, um, but the, there's a lot more detail in, uh, and references and things in the notes. But just to recap, the basic recipe, which, which works, I've shown you a toy, a toy example of how this happens, but the basic re recipe is that you uh, start with a, a spontaneously broken U1, U1 Petchy Quinn. Uh, you get a massless Goldstone boson. But because of, uh, I should say massless-ish, because of, of uh, the non-perturbative QCD corrections, which you can calculate just directly from pion physics. So you might think, well, I should start from, from this term here, pull the axion into this term here and calculate. But that would be much more difficult. You'd get exactly the same answer. But we can actually take the chiral Lagrangian for pions that we already had, and that captures all of the non-perturbative QCD effects. So we take the, the chiral Lagrangian with the quark condensate, and uh, calculate what we get. And it turns out that, that this is no longer massless. It becomes massive because of these non-perturbative effects. But you can very uh, easily calculate the mass. And the, the, the axion potential um, is such that when you minimize, uh, go to the bottom of the axion potential, you exactly cancel the, the total strong CP angle. Now, I showed this for, for a particular model where I was discussing the um, the, the light quarks. But you could actually do this in many, many different ways. Say you started with a theory where you had this scalar field phi coupled to some other quarks without the Higgs, so not a higher dimension operator. Then those other quarks would get a, a mass proportional to F. So F could be some very high, uh, high scale where the Petchy Quinn symmetry is spontaneously broken. Um, and then you might say, well, how on earth could I calculate the axion mass from pion physics when the axion is now coupled to some other very heavy quarks in the theory, vector-like quarks, um, that may live at you know, 10 to the 12 GeV or something like this. But it's actually quite straightforward, because what you do is you do a, a U1 axial transformation of those heavy quarks. And what that does is pulls the axion all the way into this term here. 
Then you do a U1 axial transformation on the light corks, and it pulls that, the axion right back into here in front of the light cork, uh, back into the light cork mass terms. And then you can just go ahead and calculate the axion mass in exactly the same way. So you use the freedom to shuffle this field around between cork masses and, and the topological term. Um, and you can always pull it back into the cork mass matrix and calculate the axion mass. Okay, um, there's one thing to note which is very interesting, which is that, as I said, when we spontaneously break a symmetry, um, you get, if it's an exact symmetry, you get a mass of Goldstone boson. And the way we see that symmetry being realized in the theory is as a shift symmetry, a continuous shift symmetry of that massless uh, Goldstone boson. Here you can see that there's no longer a uh, shift symmetry. The shift symmetry is gone. But what's interesting is you've actually, um, uh, you've not entirely gotten rid of it. What you have left over is a discrete shift symmetry. which is that A over A goes to A plus 2 pi N F, where N is some integer. If I shift the argument of the cosine by uh, some integer times 2 pi, then it all remains the same. Okay, so those, those are the, the, the sort of the quick basics of, um, of uh, the strong CP problem and uh, the axiom. I think Tracy showed earlier, if you differentiate this twice, you get the axion mass. So differentiating it twice, you just get f pi squared m pi squared over um, f squared. f could be any number. There's no, there's no reason that this should, um, should be uh, at low energies. And the, the story goes that um, you know, Weinberg and Wilczek tried to embed this in a weak scale model where f would be around the weak scale. But the model is very, very predictive, and it predicts all sorts of, when you put this in and you include the pions in the, the, the Carol Lagrangian, um, it predicts all sorts of couplings of the axion to the light mesons as a function of f. And so it was very straightforward to go and search for the axion right from the outset, and it wasn't found. And there are many, many constraints. I'll, I can actually, I think there's just about time to, to discuss one constraint, um, where you see that f axion has to be a uh, uh, very high scale indeed. Um, but it was originally uh, uh, thought to be, uh, F was thought to be around the weak scale and the axon would have been um, quite light. You see it's F pi squared over, F pi M pi over F. So if F is around the weak scale, this would be down at say an, an MeV or something like that. Um, but then there were two, uh, after that, when it was realized that it couldn't be, F can be around the weak scale. There were two models that were proposed, and they're sort of classes of models known as the KSVZ and the DFSV models, um, where you use heavy quarks or heavy scalars, and the spontaneous breaking can essentially be at any scale you want. So F can be, can, can be anywhere. It's essentially a free parameter. Um, OK, so I will do a little bit of axion phenomenology, um, covering the bits I, that um, Robert and Tracy are not covering, as far as I'm aware. So one interesting thing is that all of the axion couplings, because it's a Goldstone boson, then apart from the, the non-perturbative QCD effects proportional to F pi and M pi, all of its couplings um, have to respect the shift symmetry. So all of its couplings will be derivative. So they will look something like the, the interactions will look something like Cj uh, over F d mu A. So this is this holds true for all of the, the the sort of the classical Lagrangian because it's that guy didn't break the the the, the shift symmetry. It was only the non-perturbative effects proportional to m pi squared which broke the shift symmetry. So to a good approximation. Um, this is what the couplings of the axon looks like. And then they, they, it is interacting with some, uh, some current. I'll call it theta j. And theta j could be all sorts of things. It could be um, uh, a quark current, an axial quark current. It could be uh, a lepton current. Different models will, will populate theory space. Be all sort, there are all sorts of couplings you can have. It could be the Chern-Simons current for um, electromagnetism. 
Kotcher and Simons, such that when I move the total derivative, when I, when I include, move the total derivative just by integration by parts onto this side, I would get FF dual for the photon. And of course, it can be the, the, the churn Simons current for, uh, or it has to be the churn Simons current for, for uh, QCD as well. And so on. But the important lesson here, and this is, so, so there's a shift symmetry and that dictates that this guy has to have derivative interactions, that there should always be a basis after you do total derivatives, in which you will see it has derivative interactions. Um, <clears throat> and that will respect the shift symmetry. But another tool that we learned from yesterday is that um, uh, we have a whole bunch of higher dimension operators. You see that these are dimension, dimension uh, 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 three currents, and this is dimension two, that's dimension one, so these are all higher dimension operators. And what that tells us is that amplitudes, matrix elements for, for various scattering processes, will tend to be proportional to the energy of the scattering process at hand, whatever uh, energy you're producing this axion at, um, divided by F uh, to some power, and dep which depends on the process and the, you know, how many axion legs you have attached and uh, how high dimension the operator is. Okay, so why am I telling you this? So as I said, F can be a free parameter. F could be a very large scale. It could be 10 to the 12 GV or something like this. But the energies that we can access in the lab at most go up to say uh, a, a few TeV. So if this is 10 to the 10 or 10 to the 12 GeV, and this is 10 to the 3 GeV, if, even if N is one, that this, this is a very, very small number, which is telling you that axions with large decay constants are very, very weakly coupled. So the only way to overcome this, this very, very weak coupling um, is to have some sort of very high luminosity experiment because the couplings are tiny, and as I'm sure uh, uh, Robert will have mentioned, you know, if you have tiny couplings, the only way to go is to, 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 to discover something is to go to very high luminosity. And it turns out that um, there are some very high luminosity experiments in our neighborhood, which are stars. Stars are very, very big, which means that if something happens in scattering within a star, um, because there's so many uh, protons and, and electrons in a star and photons in a star, this means that because they're very, very big, um, even if that scattering process is extremely rare, you see that this is a very small number, typical energies in a star around uh, like the sun would be around a KV or something like this. Even though this is a very, very small number, um, you could hope to see, observe the effects of, of axion scattering um, uh, simply because there's so much stuff in a star that you could produce axions um, where in such quantities that you have some large number here, or the, the sum over amplitude squared becomes a large enough number that this um, is compensated. And this indeed can happen. So in a star, you can have processes like gamma plus ZE goes to A plus ZE. Um, and if this happens in a star, I'll just uh, uh, call that ZE. This is just the, the total number of, some number of electrons. Um, you could produce an axion which actually escapes the star. It's so weakly coupled that you've produced it with some low energy, say around a KV or something like that. Um, but because the, the, the matrix element for rescattering is so small, it will typically escape the star and, and flow out. And this could actually, can actually lead to a, um, a source for um, cooling the star, which can be more efficient or comparably efficient to the standard model sources. So for example, if you had a comparable diagram, there are lots of different diagrams that, that can be important here, but I'll just, I'm just sketching the possibilities here. Um, processes involving, for example, photons scattering off, off electrons. That photon that, that you've produced, compared to the, the axion that you produced, will be reabsorbed inside the star. So we can actually, I'm gonna do a, a super back of the envelope uh, calculation or estimate, which is that the rate for this process, we know if, if the axion escapes the star um, and you're working at some temperature, the rate for this process must scale like um, if we just had n equals one, so we're starting with an operator like this guy here for electrons, so we have one derivative on the axon divided by f, so n equals one, then the cross section goes like e over f squared, and we're working at a temperature of around t, so t is the sort of typical 
um, uh, uh, energy scale within the star, then this process will be proportional to, ha just on dimensional grounds, T over F squared, typically, multiplied by the, the total amount of stuff in the star, multiplied by N. Similarly, if we, do a, a pro if we estimate this process here, all of the bulk stuff is not going to escape. So what escapes can only be happening on the surface. And then, so, so the, the cooling rate from processes like this, again, doing this is extreme, extremely sloppy, just to show you how you can use a star to probe axion physics. Um, this process will scale like, here my coupling was E over F. That's my, my guy uh, with dimensions of coupling. So for here, we have two uh, um, electromagnetic couplings. So I will write it as four pi alpha. Just to be careful with my four pi's, I didn't put a four pi in here. So I shouldn't put one on here. Um, scaling like the, so not equal to, proportional to. Um, scaling like the surface area of the star, which will go something like n to the two over three. In a star like the sun, n is something like 10 to the 57. So what you're seeing here is you have lower, slower scaling with n for these sorts of processes than you do for these sorts of processes. And this can help you overcome this even if t over f is a small number. So equating these two, again, just being very, very sloppy, um, setting these two equal, setting the energy to be around a few kV, or 10 kV, if you do that. Um, you know the electromagnetic coupling, you know what n is. You see that these guys are equal, roughly equal, Um, whenever uh, F is around 10 to the 5 GV. So this was very, very sloppy. If you're doing, you have some project on axion physics, do not do it like this. Open up Kolb and Turner and, uh, and calculate everything properly. Just on dimensional grounds and scaling with volume versus surface area, you can see that you could hope with stars to probe um, very large decay constants. So you're probing couplings that have been generated at very high energies or sorry, with very large decay constants. So either uh, low energy and small coupling or order one coupling and high energy. And, um, and this means that, that uh, uh, by searching for axions in this way, there are even more sensitive processes involving white dwarfs and, and supernova. You can hope to search for, for axions. And in fact, um, using stellar processes like this, you can exclude uh, axion decay constants all the way up to say 10 to the nine GeV or 10 to the 10 GeV. Okay, um, so I'm gonna leave it there for the axion for now and uh, move on to something else. Are there any questions? Nope, okay, super. So considering we have 15 minutes left, um, I want to, just like at the end of the last lecture, I showed you this sort of much more speculative non-mainstream theory which was um, the, the, the twin Higgs. I'd like to do a similar thing here. So take this um, with a health disclaimer. This is not, you know, widely, you will not find this in, in textbooks. It's not widely accepted, but it is something that, that um, uh, people are thinking about and have been thinking about um, in the model building community for the last uh, few years. Um, so I just want to sketch it, and it involves axions, but also involves the hierarchy problem. So it sort of connects the two um, main topics of these lectures. Actually, I probably won't need more than that. Okay, so the, the idea, the setup is known as the relaxion. And the idea is as follows. This will again um, utilize a bunch of the tools that we discussed in the, the, the first lecture. So the idea is to combine the strong CP problem and the axion solution um, with the hierarchy problem and try and find some um, cosmological explanation for why the Higgs mass might be far below the cutoff of the theory. So as I said before, um, if you believe that there's some UV completion for the, the standard model where the, the um, electroweak scale is calculable in terms of the, the parameters of the UV completion, just like for the pion, it was calculable in terms of the quark masses and the uh, 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 QCD gauge coupling. Um, if you believe that's the story for the standard model, then we have this puzzle, because why um, is the, if that's the case, and we have no symmetry in the standard model that can clearly protect the, the, the Higgs from getting uh, corrections to its mass, just like there was no symmetry for the charged pion when it coupled to the photon, then why is it so light? 
And this is a very uh, interesting and uh, super creative idea that um, Peter Graham, David Kaplan, and Sergey Rajendran put out, I guess it's four, four years ago now. And their main idea is that, as we see in the, saw in the standard model, there's no symmetry um, which, makes, which can justify why the Higgs could be much lighter than the, the, the scale of the UV completion where the electroweak scale is, is generated. Um, there's no symmetry reason, but the point where um, Higgs squared is much, much less than the cutoff squared may be a, a point of enhanced, may not be a point of enhanced symmetry, but it may be special dynamically. So <coughs> how do they do this? So the idea is that you'll have some cosmological dynamics which picks out this point in parameter space as a special one. Um, and, uh, and, and then that would, the idea is that that would explain why, the, the, why you have a, a natural hierarchy. So they take the standard model and treat it as an EFT. So then we do everything we would normally do. There's all the standard model terms. And there's some large uh, expected correction to the, the Higgs mass of order the UV scale. So the UV scale will be big M. So this might be large. It might be you know, 10 TV or 100 TV or something like this. So you take this, this to be uh, uh, the theory of nature. And we're really taking seriously the notion that the standard model is an EFT. And then you add a scalar with a shift symmetry. You'll see that the scalar sort of wants to be a Goldstone boson. So these will be the different steps. Um, couple this scalar to QCD. So we have a, the, the usual term. I think it should have a G squared in there, 32. I squared F G G joule. And you can see if we did one of those chiral rotations um, in the, the previous, what we, just, what we just discussed, that you could rotate this if you started off with some axion-like coupling to the quarks. You do a chiral rotation, you pull the, the axion-like coupling in here. So this is really how the axion couples to G G joule. So this so far, this story so far is just an axion model. Um, and we saw earlier that perturbatively, this, this term here is not going to do anything to the axion because it's actually a total, um, this term is a total derivative. So I could move d mu, j mu, move the d mu onto phi and just have j mu. And you see that phi has a shift symmetry. So this is not going to generate any scalar potential for, for phi apart from the non-perturbative uh, effects that we already discussed that come out proportional to m pi squared, f pi squared. And then... What they finally do is break the shift symmetry explicitly. And they have some spurion. So this is, again, using all of the tools from the first lecture. They have some spurion, g, um, which is the parameter that breaks the shift symmetry on phi. So you can have now couplings that look like g phi Higgs squared. You can have couplings that go like g m squared phi, uh, couplings that go like 1 half g squared phi squared. Basically, everywhere that phi enters with a coupling that breaks the shift symmetry, there should be a g coming along for the ride. They chose to define g as a parameter that has mass dimension 1. I still don't know why they did that. So I'm going to follow what they did so you can look up the paper. But um, you could equally call this epsilon times big M if you wanted. And it's all, it, all of the physics is the same. And you just write down. You follow all the rules of EFT. You write down everything you're allowed to write down. You just uh, go for it and, uh, and uh, see what you get. So now let us think about what, this, what the potential for this scalar looks like um, in terms of uh, at zero temperature. What I'm going to plot is the, the scalar potential as a function of this field phi. This is the potential energy contained in the field. 
So we see here from terms like this, and we can add all of them, suppressed by the, the, the cutoff higher dimension operators as far up as you want. But what we see from this guy here is that we get some sort of smooth potential doing something. As I, move, as I change phi, this is just some boring polynomial, and it will just do boring polynomial things. However, as we're changing the, the value of phi, as I, if I change the value of phi, you see here that this term is actually changing the background value of the Higgs mass squared. So I could have my scalar potential without doing any fine tuning, such that over here, the Higgs mass squared is positive. But after I've changed, so you see this has the opposite sign from the m squared, so as I'm changing phi, if I increase phi, the, the um, Higgs mass squared, sorry, it should be, yeah. Uh, as I increase um, phi, the Higgs mass squared is becoming smaller and smaller and smaller. And at some critical point, let's call it the background value of phi is just um, g phi is equal to minus m squared. So uh, phi is just m squared over g, big m squared over g. At some critical point, the uh, Higgs mass squared, the total Higgs mass squared as a function of phi will pass through zero and start to become negative. What that means is that the Higgs mass, that the, the Higgs will start to get a vacuum expectation value. So what happens to the scalar potential for phi? So that calculation we did earlier, we found out that the, the scalar potential for phi goes like this. It was just the, ax, the, the, the bit from, from QCD was scaling like um, f pi squared, m pi squared, cosine of uh, phi over f. I've just absorbed the background QCD angle into a shift of phi, so I've just shifted this whole thing to set that to zero, which is fine. So this goes like f pi squared, m pi squared, great. But m pi squared depends on um, the, the Higgs VEF. As we pointed out yesterday, uh, sorry, on Monday, the, the, the um, quark masses are like a spurion for explicit breaking of the SU2 left cross SU2 right, which means that the only thing controlling the pion masses has to be the quark mass terms. If the quark mass terms went to zero, the pion mass would be zero. So this potential would actually vanish. So this is actually depending, it's proportional, has to be proportional to something that scales like f pi cubed m quark cosine of phi f. Which means that it's proportional to f pi cubed times some quark yukawas, lambda up down, whatever, the vev of the Higgs cosine of phi f which tells you that to a very good approximation, there's tiny corrections to this, but to a very good approximation, the axion potential um, scales linearly with the, the Higgs VEV. But what I said was as, I, as we go from left to right on this plot, phi is scanning the, the, the Higgs mass squared, which will at some point cross through zero. So the Higgs vacuum expectation value actually turns on around here. And then it starts to get bigger and bigger and bigger. And as it's starting to get bigger and bigger and bigger, the envelope of this cosine, because this is just depending on the Higgs wave, is becoming bigger and bigger and bigger. So you cross through this point, and it doesn't actually look like this. You're coming down, there's some smooth function, and then all of a sudden you get uh, wiggles that are growing and growing and growing. So now you can see what the, what the game will be. The game here is to find a way such that you have some initial condition that isn't super fine-tuned. You just say that the, 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 this field phi, the relaxion, starts somewhere around here, and it will roll. And as it's rolling, the, the, it'll roll down its potential, and as it's rolling, the Higgs mass squared will be changing. It'll be uh, becoming smaller and smaller and smaller until the point that it goes through zero and becomes negative. And then you want the, axion, the relaxion field to get stuck somewhere soon. So stuck somewhere where the Higgs mass squared has just gone through zero, but it may have some, uh, some small value. That's the idea. So how can this work? Well, in order for it to get stuck, this guy, if we wanted it to get stuck right here at the observed value for the, the Higgs VEV, then this is telling you that the total, the, the, if it's going to get stuck, it means it has to be at a local minimum. What's a local minimum? It's just when the first derivative as a, as a, of the, the potential as a function of phi um, vanishes. So it's telling you that the, the first derivative looks sort of like this. There are other terms, but they're similar in magnitude. So dv by d phi 
uh, will be zero, which is telling you that um, g m squared is of order uh, f pi squared m pi squared over f squared f sine of phi over f. So that's where when it will get stuck, which means that if I choose g to be small, then I can ensure that it will get stuck. This will happen for some angle, some phi over f. I can ensure that if g is small, that this will happen when this overall combination is small, um, thus it, meaning it will happen when the Higgs vev is small. But the trick, or one of the tricks, is that I can choose g in principle to be, from an effective field theory perspective, as small as I want, because it's the only spurion that perturbatively breaks the shift symmetry of phi. So I can, if, if in my UV completion, whatever it is, the only shift symmetry breaking is, is proportional to G, then that will be true and it will remain in the, the infrared effective field theory as well. So this is the game. You roll down. There's a local minimum starts to appear if you satisfy this equation. Um, G can be, can, F is going to have to be, you know, 10 to the 10 GV or something like this to satisfy all these stellar cooling bounds. Um, but you can then choose G to be very, very small such that, uh, such that you satisfy this. Of course, you will have spotted that if this were just flat space, the kinetic energy of phi would be conserved. So as you roll down, there's no way you can get stuck in the local minimum. If you're, if you're not doing cosmology and you just plot, if you start with phi up here, it's going to roll down. Indeed, there are, little, there are minima that show up here, but um, it has enough energy to go the whole way down and back up the next slope and keep going. But if you do this during inflation, so you have some background inflation occurring, then this actually damps the motion of phi. The, the equation of motion for phi will be something like uh, phi double dot plus 3h phi dot is equal to dv by d phi. And you see that this is like a damped harmonic oscillator. So this adds a damping term, which actually slows the rolling of phi, and it can reach, just like for inflation, a steady state uh, rolling, where it's rolling at the same velocity the whole time, very smoothly in a controlled manner. And then, because that velocity can be slow, it won't have enough energy to get up over the next, the next hump, and it will just uh, settle down, oscillate around its minimum, and then, uh, then settle down there. So they do this in uh, an inflating background as well. Now there are just two minutes, um, a bunch of constraints you have to satisfy. So for example, if you're going to scan, be able to scan, this is enough to cancel off whatever the original Higgs mass squared was. You have to travel through a field distance, which is of order uh, delta phi has to be around bigger than um, m squared over g. Um, the Hubble scale during inflation has to be larger than m squared over m Planck. So Hubble just looks like the, the the square root of the scalar potential divided by m Planck. And um, you see that here, if you plug in this field distance, delta phi, back into this action, you see that the total scalar potential height has changed by about m to the 4. They cut off to the fourth value, which means that if this isn't going to be the inflaton, if there's some other inflaton, then there must be some contribution uh, to the scalar potential, which is roughly constant for the inflation to occur, um, which is larger than that. You need to be able to form uh, the, the axion potential in the first place, which tells you that the, the Hubble scale during inflation has to be less than lambda QCD. There are two, two ways to see this. One is that um, uh, in De Sitter space, you have effect, uh, effective, uh, effectively a horizon of a given size, which is related to the Hubble scale. And for those instantons that I described to fit into that horizon, um, you need the strong coupling scale to be, to be uh, larger than, so that the size is the inverse of the strong coupling scale, the strong coupling scale to be larger than the, uh, the Hubble scale. And it turns out that those instantons that dominate the contributions that generate the axon potential are in the ballpark of where the strong coupling is strong, which is around uh, lambda QCD. The other way to see this is that during, um, in, in De Sitter, you have a sort of uh, an effective temperature, the Gibbons Hawking temperature, which means that you can think of this as being like a finite temperature system. And the axion potential, the instantons, get washed out in the axion potential if you're at high temperatures. So another way of seeing this is that you can think of this as being like high temperature. 
and if the temperature were too high, you wouldn't generate the axion potential at all. Those are two ways of seeing it. Another constraint is that the Hubble scale during inflation has to be less than gm squared to the third. Um, the reason for this is that you have fluctuations of the scalar field in the sitter, which are of order the Hubble scale. So the scalar field, you can think of it as fluctuating sort of in a quantum mechanical sense. As it's rolling down, you can't quite pin it down, it's fluctuating, or you can even think of it as sort of being like finite temperature, it's fluctuating around. But if those fluctuations are, in a given time period, are larger than the distance it would have rolled during that time period classically down the slope, then you've completely lost predictivity because this thing is fluctuating more than it's rolling. So you're, you're just going to populate the, all of the different uh, um, uh, Hubble patches that you get in the end of the day. We'll have the scalar field phi spread all over the show, and there'll be some non-zero but small probability that you find yourself uh, in this point. If you satisfy this classical versus uh, quantum uh, constraint, then this classical rolling is dominating it, um, so that will dominate where you expect to, to land. I'll come back to that in a second. Um, and then you have to satisfy this, that you can form a minimum in the first place for an order one um, angle. So when you do this, if you try and maximize the cutoff, you get that the cutoff of this theory um, has to be less than about um, 10 to the 7 GeVs times 10 to the 9 GV over F to the 1 over 6. Um, G has to be something in, in dimensions, in, in, in GV, something like 10 to the minus, I think it was 26 GV. So this isn't just a small number, this is an extremely small number. You know, if the cutoff is 10 to the 7 uh, uh, GV, then you're saying that if you are to write this as a dimensionless number, epsilon, then it would be something like uh, 10 to the minus 33. Um, the field range that you traverse is of order delta phi, is of order uh, 10 to the 40 GeV, uh, which isn't just super Planckian, it's super duper Planckian. You know, we worry about super Planckian field excursions for scalar fields, weak gravity conjecture, all of that sort of stuff. Uh, this, goes, this blows all of that out, out of the water. It's an enormous field excursion. Um, and the number, number of um, E foldings you require for this thing to have time to roll all the way down and do this is something like um, 10 to the 43. Now, you may say, who cares? We see numbers like this in inflation all the time. This is the number of E foldings. This is in the exponent. This is E to the 10 to the 43 is this growth of the scale factor. Um, there's some model building questions uh, raised by these parameters and these num the, the E foldings, the inflationary story. Um, furthermore, um, so there are three, three issues. So those are model building uh, issues. Um, some people don't care about it. Some people care about it a lot. Um, another thing is that in this example that I showed, it will stop. It will only stop whenever theta over f isn't zero. If this were zero, it couldn't stop because this, you would never balance this. So it can only stop when theta over f is non-zero, which means you have a non-zero effective strong CP angle. So this model actually predicts a large neutron EDM, this very simple model. So you have to add extra ingredients to get around that. And then the last thing, um, which is more, the last two things which are sort of more qualitative are that, uh, first of all, if you've landed in this vacuum, this also happens to coincide with the vacuum that has zero total energy, or very close to zero total energy, because we have a small, observe a small cosmological constant now. So in this scenario, um, while for things like supersymmetry, you may imagine there's some mechanism to relax the cosmological constant to zero at some, some late times, this one, um, it changes it because it has to happen at very late times in the sense that this has to have known, the, the, there's some interplay now between the, the cosmological constant and where you, size of the cosmological constant and where you happen to land because had you landed here, the weak scale wouldn't be much different but the total vacuum energy would be different by about lambda QCD to the fourth power which is uh, a GeV essentially. Um, so there's an extra puzzle with, with um, uh, in terms of um, uh, the strong, the strong tying this to the, the cosmological constant problem. And a final uh, issue, which again, some people are very worried about, some people don't, don't care about it at all, is that if you embed this in, a, in an inflationary epoch, then basically all the things that can happen tend to happen. So you can populate this, this scalar field phi if inflation is happening for such a long time. Um, 
could have been populated um, all over this, this vacuum. So then there's a quest questions arise about why you didn't end up way, way down here or, or, or some other place about really how well you can calculate the prediction that you land here within some very long inflating background and within sort of a, 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 a multiverse sort of uh, um, setup. Nonetheless, I wanted to, to tell you about this today in the last, these last 15 minutes because I think this at least um, illustrates a very interesting class of approaches that people are starting to develop now. So this is one of now a handful of sort of models that try to use cosmology that mean that maybe these symmetry-based approaches that for the, the electroweak hierarchy problem, the, 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 the origin of the, the weak scale, um, the symmetry-based approaches that we've studied so far, like the composite, the, the pseudo goldstone boson higgs approach and, and other ones we can discuss tomorrow or on Friday, um, maybe they're barking up the wrong tree. Maybe there's some very non-trivial cosmological dynamics that actually picks out uh, uh, an interesting point uh, where you get a small uh, weak scale because of some interplay between cosmological dynamics and the structure of the standard model. So I think this is a very interesting idea. As I said, it's not widely accepted as being a definite solution to the hierarchy problem. That uh, depends on people's own uh, perspective. Um, but it certainly shows a very interesting class of, of approaches that are now starting to get to be developed. And I think I should leave it there. Thank you very much.